I would like to now turn things over to the secretary of the New York City Bar White Collar Committee, Marshall Miller, who will introduce our first keynote speaker. Uh, Marshall is with Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz. Prior to joining Wachtell, he was the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General and Chief of Staff of the Justice Department's Criminal Division, where he supervised more than 600 federal prosecutors and oversaw the Justice Department's most significant prosecutions. Uh, before that, he served as the Chief of the Criminal Division for the United States Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York. Uh, Marshall. Thank you, Michael. It is my great honor to introduce my friend and former colleague, the 37th Deputy Attorney General of the United States, Rod Rosenstein. At the outset, uh, the Deputy Attorney General Security Detail has asked that everyone remain seated at the end of uh, his remarks uh, for a smooth exit. The Deputy Attorney General has dedicated his entire legal career to public service and to the Department of Justice, an institution that has served as a beacon of hope and a protector of freedom for the American people throughout our nation's history. Rod started in DOJ's honors program, prosecuting public corruption cases in the criminal division's public integrity section. He helped run DOJ's tax division. He was an assistant United States attorney in the District of Maryland and was chosen to serve there as the United States attorney for that district by both President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama. A rare, a rare feat in this partisan age. And Rod has never strayed too far from the courtroom, trying and arguing individual cases personally in all of those positions, no matter how high ranking, including most recently a case before the United States Supreme Court. Having had the good fortune to serve alongside Rod, I have witnessed firsthand his dedication, his intelligence and judgment, and the camaraderie that he brings to his work at DOJ. Now today, we live in a time where political chasms seem to divide our nation, where the 24-7 news cycle seems to promote controversy, and where, unfortunately, many of our nation's institutions no longer enjoy the public confidence they once did. And in such a world, public service is more important than ever. Dedicated, energetic, and able public servants are more important than ever. For it is in challenging times, I think, that true public servants can do the most good and can make the biggest difference. And with that principle in mind, I'd like to take a moment here to thank the Deputy Attorney General for his 28 years of service to our nation at DOJ. And I also want to thank the members of his staff who are here today for their service, including the brave men and women who ensure the Deputy Attorney General's security. As Americans, we owe all of you a great debt of gratitude. And in challenging times like ours, it's more important than ever that our leaders, particularly the leaders of the Department of Justice, demonstrate unfailing commitment to the rule of law. For it is the rule of law that protects every American, that safeguards our rights, and protects our freedoms, and that ensures our security. It is the rule of law that breathes life into Teddy Roosevelt's famous statement that no one is above the law and no one below it. The Deputy Attorney General has spoken eloquently, and at least based on the emails I get from DOJ's Office of Public Affairs quite frequently, about the importance, the crucial importance of the rule of law, about the importance of seeking justice without fear or favor. New York's beloved founding father, Alexander Hamilton, once said that, America's, that an American's most sacred duty is to maintain an inviolable respect for the Constitution and for the rule of law. Rod Rosenstein understands that most sacred duty. He's dedicated his career to it. And we're very lucky to have him here this morning at the New York City Bar Association. Welcome, Rod. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Marshall, for that kind introduction, which was mostly not about me, which I particularly appreciated. Uh, although I must say that uh, Marshall's warning that you all should remain seated during my exit reminds me of a film that was popular in my teenage years, Escape from New York. 
I don't think I'll have that much difficulty exiting, but, uh, but Marshall, I appreciate your many years of service in the Department of Justice. I'm also grateful to Michael Schachter for chairing this event and to the staff of the New York City Bar for your courtesy. I think the last time uh, I was in this majestic building was about 15 years ago. I was working in the department's tax division. I was here for a seminar on tax law uh, and I had the opportunity to visit this building, which I think is a fitting monument to the rule of law. There are many current and former department colleagues and friends in the audience, as well as uh, friends from law firms in the private sector. I'm very happy to be here with you in Manhattan. As you may know, I've been kind of busy in Washington <laughs> recently, uh, and so it's particularly uh, pleasant for me to be here with you. But after I speak with you this morning, uh, I need to head across Times Square to participate in the annual conference about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, also here in New York this very day. I did not intend to deliver two speeches about white-collar crime today. When I received the invitations a few months ago, I intended to delegate one of them to a Senate-confirmed Assistant Attorney General for the Justice Department's Criminal Division. The President nominated a highly qualified lawyer known to many of you, Brian Benjikowski, to serve in that position about a year ago. But Brian is still awaiting a confirmation vote, as are Jeffrey Clark, our nominee for the Environment and Natural Resources Division, Eric Dryband for the Civil Rights Division, and Jody Hunt for the Civil Division. Each nominee meets or exceeds the normal qualifications for those important jobs. President Trump deserves great credit for nominating champions of the rule of law to serve in these important positions in the Department of Justice. But one year later, too many of them are still waiting in the wings. There are seven litigating divisions in Maine Justice. Only two of them have Senate-confirmed leaders. When the founders drafted the Constitution in 1787, this is probably not what they had in mind. It used to take only a few days to obtain advice and consent from the United States Senate to presidential nominations. Unfortunately, under the leadership of Attorney General Jeff Sessions, we have assembled a superb team to serve as acting heads of the divisions of the Department of Justice, and we will keep moving forward. We are aggressively pursuing crimes that represent imminent threats to the American people. Those include terrorism, gang violence, drug trafficking, child exploitation, elder abuse, and human smuggling. Now, fortunately, we have sufficient resources to enhance our commitment to those important new priorities without detracting from our enforcement of other violations, including white collar crime. White collar crime disrupts the ordinary and organized operation of markets, it defrauds victims, and it undermines the rule of law. Our goal is to deter crime. We can only do that by holding accountable the perpetrators who cheat the government in an effort to gain a competitive advantage. Effective crime prevention requires strong relationships among enforcement authorities and law-abiding businesses. Our department is committed to reinforcing our relationships with good corporate citizens. That is reflected in a series of concrete proposals, concrete policies enacted by the Department of Justice over the past year. You will see it, you'll continue to see it reflected in the faithful execution of those policies by our agents and attorneys. One of my favorite management parables is about a child who watches her mother prepare a roast beef. The mother cuts off the ends of the roast before putting it in the pan and putting it in the oven. And the child asks why. The mother says she learned it that way from her mother. So the child asks her grandmother. The grandmother explains, well, when your mother was a child, I cut the ends off because my pan wasn't big enough to fit the whole roast. <laughs> the moral is that the solutions of the past are not necessarily the right solutions today. Circumstances change. We should be willing to reconsider our assumptions. Whenever we mention that an existing policy is under review, I find that defenders of the status quo proclaim that the existing version of the policy is just exactly right. Now, maybe so. Maybe some department policies are exactly right, but sometimes we need to review whether an existing policy accomplishes its goals and best meets our current needs. I hope that our attorneys will continue to share their experiences, accept input from stakeholders like all of you, and make suggestions about policy changes that should be considered in the future. Let me discuss a few recent policy changes. In June of 2017, 
Attorney General Sessions announced that the Department would end the practice of third-party settlement payments to non-government organizations that were not harmed by the defendant's conduct. Last November, the Attorney General announced a Department policy to prohibit improper use of and reliance on agency guidance documents. Also in November, we announced the Department's new Foreign Corrupt Practices Act enforcement policy. It promotes greater clarity and consistency in FCPA enforcement efforts, and it provides stronger incentives for companies to voluntarily disclose misconduct, fully cooperate, and remediate any harm. Today, we are announcing a new Department policy that encourages coordination among Department components and other enforcement agencies when imposing multiple penalties for the same misconduct. The aim is to enhance relationships with our law enforcement partners in the United States and abroad while avoiding unfair duplicative penalties. It is very important for us to be aggressive in pursuing wrongdoers, but we should discourage disproportionate enforcement of laws by multiple authorities. In football, the term piling on refers to a player jumping on a pile of other players after the opponent has already been tackled. Our new policy discourages piling on by instructing department components to appropriately coordinate with one another and with other enforcement agencies in imposing multiple punishments on one company in relation to investigations of the same misconduct. In highly regulated industries, the ones that many of you represent, a company may be accountable to multiple regulatory bodies both domestically and overseas. That creates a risk of repeated punishments that may exceed what is necessary to rectify the harm and to deter future violations. Now, sometimes government authorities coordinate very well. They are force multipliers in their respective efforts to punish and deter fraud. They achieve efficiencies and they limit unnecessary regulatory burdens. But other times, joint or parallel investigations by multiple agencies sound less like singing in harmony and more like competing attempts to sing solo. Modern business operations routinely span multiple jurisdictions and borders. Whistleblowers report misconduct to multiple enforcement authorities, which may investigate the claims jointly or through their own separate and independent investigative authorities. By working with other agencies, including the SEC, CFTC, Federal Reserve, FDIC, OCC, OFAC, to name just a few, our department is better able to detect sophisticated fraud schemes and deploy adequate remedies and penalties to ensure market integrity. But we have heard concerns about piling on from our own department personnel. Our prosecutors and civil enforcement attorneys prize the department's reputation for fairness. They understand the importance of protecting our brand they asked for our support in coordinating internally and with other agencies to achieve reasonable and proportionate outcomes in major corporate investigations. And I know that many federal, state, local, and foreign authorities that work with us are interested in joining our efforts to show leadership in this area. Piling on can deprive a company of the benefits, certainty, and finality ordinarily obtained through a full and final settlement. We need to consider the impact on innocent employees, customers, and investors who seek to resolve problems and move on. We need to think about whether devoting additional investigative resources to enforce the law against an old scheme is more valuable than devoting those resources to fighting a new one. Our new policy provides no private right of action. It's not enforceable in court, but it will be reflected in the U.S. Attorney's Manual, and like all other provisions of the manual, it will guide uh, the conduct of Department of Justice employees. This is another step toward greater transparency and consistency in corporate enforcement. To reduce white-collar crime, we need to encourage companies to report suspected wrongdoing to law enforcement promptly and to resolve liability expeditiously so we can move on to other important matters. Now, there are four key aspects of the new policy. First, the policy affirms that the federal government's criminal enforcement authority should not be used against a company for purposes unrelated to the investigation and prosecution of a possible crime. We should not employ the threat of potential criminal prosecution solely to persuade a company to pay a larger settlement in a civil case. 
this is not a policy change. It's a reminder of and commitment to principles of fairness and the rule of law. Second, the policy addresses situations in which department attorneys, department attorneys in different components and offices may be seeking to resolve a corporate case based on the same underlying misconduct. The new policy directs department personnel to coordinate with each other to achieve an overall equitable result. The coordination may include crediting and apportionment of financial penalties, fines, and forfeiture, and other means of avoiding disproportionate punishment. Third, the policy encourages department attorneys, when possible, to coordinate with other federal, state, local, and foreign counterparts seeking to resolve a case with a company for the same misconduct. And finally, the policy sets forth some factors that department attorneys may evaluate in determining whether multiple penalties serve the interests of justice in a particular case. Sometimes penalties that appear duplicative really are essential to achieve justice and to protect the public. In those cases, we will not hesitate to pursue complete remedies and to assist our law enforcement partners in doing the same. The factors identified in the policy that may guide this determination include the egregiousness of the wrongdoing, statutory mandates regarding penalties, the risk of delay in finalizing a resolution, and the adequacy and timeliness of a company's disclosures and cooperation with the department. Now, I know that some skeptics will say, if a policy is not enforceable in court, if it's purely internal, um, what good is it? And the answer I can give you, based on my nearly three decades of experience in the department, is that these internal policy guidelines have an impact in the way we exercise our discretion. We don't want to eliminate discretion in the Department of Justice. What we want to do is channel it and guide it and make sure that all of our employees are you know, following the same general guidelines. That's the purpose of these policies. Cooperating with a different agency or foreign government, of course, is not a substitute for cooperating with the United States Department of Justice. And we will not look kindly on companies that come to the Justice Department only after making inadequate disclosures to secure lenient penalties with other agencies or foreign governments. In those instances, the Department will act without hesitation to fully vindicate the interests of the United States. The Department's ability to coordinate joint outcomes in parallel proceedings is also constrained by more practical concerns. The timing of other agency actions limits on information sharing across borders and diplomatic relations between countries are some of the things that sometimes challenge us and limit our ability to fully coordinate and achieve easy answers. Now the idea of coordination is not new. The criminal division's fraud section and many of our U.S. attorney's offices routinely coordinate with the CFTC, the SEC, the Federal Reserve and other financial regulators, as well as with a wide variety of foreign partners. The FCPA unit announced its first coordinated resolution with the country of Singapore this past December, and we continue to expand our coordination and cooperation with foreign law enforcement agencies throughout the world. The Antitrust Division, which faces similar challenges on a global basis, has cooperated with 21 international agencies through 58 different merger investigations just during the past four years. And our National Security Division works closely with the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, among other agencies, to coordinate and secure resolutions of sanctions and export control violations in which OFAC deems its penalties satisfied by a company's payments to the Department of Justice. So this sort of coordination uh, you see increasingly across the government. Coordination also will help us to identify culpable individuals and hold them accountable. We will seek appropriate corporate penalties when justified by the facts and the law, but the primary question that our investigators and prosecutors should ask is who made the decision to set the company on a course of criminal conduct? Our investigation should focus on those individuals who are responsible for corporate misconduct. Our commitment to enhancing international coordination and promoting individual accountability is demonstrated by our increased cross-border enforcement. The Attorney General has designated additional attorneys and paralegals to our Department's Office of International Affairs to achieve those goals. As many of you know, our OIA, Office of International Affairs, handles the Department's mutual legal assistance and extradition requests, both incoming and outcoming, uh, with countries all around the world. And we have significantly increased the resources devoted to that unit so that we can expedite 
processing, and the Attorney General has made requests of other countries similarly to expedite their responses to our inquiries. Those additional resources help us promptly and efficiently obtain necessary evidence from abroad through mutual legal assistance treaties and other mechanisms of foreign assistance. They also strengthen efforts to return fugitives for prosecution here in the United States. At the same time, we will improve our ability to support our foreign counterparts by more expeditiously responding to their requests for assistance in securing evidence of fugitives located within our borders when it is justified by the facts and law. In 2017, our Office of International Affairs successfully returned more than 70 individuals to the United States to face fraud-related charges. Now, that trend continues. In March, OIA successfully concluded a 10-year-long extradition process that led to the criminal conviction of a Canadian fraudster. The defendant orchestrated a telemarketing scheme that cheated at least 60,000 victims of more than $1.8 million, and he has now been held accountable. We often talk about deterrence as a goal of law enforcement, but it's worthwhile to think about what causes deterrence. For 12 years before I started this job, I commuted 40 miles each way from Bethesda to Baltimore, Maryland, mostly on Interstate 95. The speed limit is 65 miles per hour on that stretch of the highway. Some people take that as a suggestion. <laughs> they know the enforcement strategy. But during those long drives, I sometimes thought about how traffic laws illustrate the mission and challenges of law enforcement. Speed limit signs deter law-abiding people. If the rules are clear, most people obey them out of a sense of duty and honor. But some people are not deterred by rules. If we announce a speed limit, but we do not enforce it, then lawbreakers will always get ahead of law-abiding people. But what if we put up a speed camera? A speed camera deters many lawbreakers. They slow down as they approach the camera. Then they speed up again. It's not a complete solution. Nonetheless, it does illustrate in a concrete way that deterrence can work. Some people do not bother to slow down at all those people will blow right by the speed cameras. They're thinking one of two things. Either they do not believe that the government will enforce the law, or they calculate that the likely penalty of breaking the law is outweighed by the personal benefit. Now, the lesson is that deterrence requires enforcement. The rules that matter most are the ones that carry expected penalties that decision makers are unwilling to pay. Focusing on deterrence requires us to think carefully about what we can achieve in our enforcement actions. Corporate settlements do not necessarily deter individual wrongdoers. They certainly don't deter them directly. They may do so indirectly by incentivizing companies to develop and enforce internal compliance programs, but at the level of each individual decision maker, the deterrent effect of a potential corporate penalty is muted and diffused. Our goal in every case should be to make the next violation less likely to occur by punishing individual wrongdoers. In order to promote consistency in our white collar efforts, we established a working group on corporate enforcement and accountability within the Department of Justice. The working group includes department leaders and senior officials from the FBI, the criminal division, the civil division, and other litigating divisions involved in significant corporate investigations including the U.S. Attorney's Office, in particular your U.S. Attorney's Office here in the Southern District of New York, uh, which has been uh, very respected and effective in corporate enforcement now uh, under the superb leadership of our new U.S. Attorney, Jeff Berman. That working group will make recommendations about white-collar crime, corporate enforcement, and related issues. And we look forward to collaborating with other agencies and regulators in implementing the new coordination policy, and we welcome input from stakeholders like you who share our commitment to reduce crime and uphold the rule of law. Most American companies are serious about engaging in lawful business practices. They want to do the right thing. They need and deserve our support to help protect them from criminals who seek unfair advantages. We need to make it safe for the honest and law-abiding players. Corporate America should regard law enforcement as an ally. In turn, the government should provide incentives for companies to engage in ethical corporate behavior 
and to assist in federal investigations. Companies can help protect themselves by using caution when choosing business associates and by ensuring appropriate oversight of their activities. That internal compliance, the work that many of you do, is critical to the integrity of American business. By effectively combating white collar crime and prosecuting individuals when appropriate, we can protect Americans from fraud and we can reduce the risk of another corporate fraud epidemic. That will require us to get the policies right, to articulate the policies clearly, to train our agents and prosecutors appropriately, and to provide appropriate oversight of ourselves. The department's rhetoric gets a lot of attention, the policy memos and the speeches, but performance matters most. When we are serious about wanting people to follow the law, it does no good merely to post a sign or announce a policy. We need to make clear our intent to enforce the law with sufficient vigor that people fear the consequences of violating it. Well, that's the lesson I learned on I-95, and I appreciate the opportunity to share it with you here today. Thank you very much.